Special thanks to $60 box seat patrons, Cinemageddon Reviews, Cyrus Solka, Gabriel9740, Kayla Ortiz, Mark S., and Origin Nicholas. Forty Second Street in Manhattan is a dazzling sight. Towering buildings that stretch over the congested city streets, each one adorned with flashing lights that can make even a run of the mill McDonald's look like a must stop destination. But behind each building's spectacular facade, there's an entirely different story. By October of 2012, Spider-Man Turn Up the Dark had turned the Foxwoods Theater on Broadway into a chaotic cacophony of wailing ambulance sirens, domesticated rock music, and audience members passionately comparing themselves to guinea pigs. This never-ending flurry of activity served as a striking juxtaposition to its next-door neighbor, the New 42 Studios. Being the premier rehearsal spot for Broadway's newest shows, the building had become a beacon of hope and adventurous optimism. This was the feeling that flooded the room on October 1st, 2012, as the warm beams of sunlight reflected off the Manhattan skyscrapers to illuminate the rehearsal space for Broadway's daring new endeavor, Rebecca the Musical. With the cast and crew assembled, a nervous energy took hold. This was the first time they had all been together following an ever-growing list of postponements, and everyone was more than ready for the process to begin. And yet, what should have been a dream of a celebration quickly turned into a reality of dread. Producer Ben Sprecher stood before the cast and crew with a tremor in his voice and a tear in his eye to announce that rehearsals were canceled. Indefinitely. The announcement shocked the cast, many of whom had uprooted their entire lives and left other jobs just to be in Rebecca. Suddenly, they were unemployed with nothing lined up. Maxim de Winter actor Ryan Silverman's mind started racing. He and his wife were new parents, and his contract with Rebecca meant he was forced to cancel a year's worth of symphony concerts just to appear in the show. As Sprecher fled the room, his producing partner Luis Florenza was left behind to finish his remarks. The entire spectrum of emotions were released. According to Silverman, some people sat in stunned disbelief, while others became red-faced in frustration. But everyone still had the same question. What the hell happened? This was the confused cry from the Schubert organization in a crowded meeting room on Friday, September 28th, 2012. It's not cheap to put on a Broadway show, and given the economic climate of the time, mixed with first-time Broadway producers Ben Sprecher and Luis Florenza, Rebecca the Musical was having an increasingly difficult time securing the last $4 million it needed to be fully capitalized. In other words, having enough money to stage the show. Earlier that year, a group of four wealthy British investors promised to provide the remaining money needed. Since the barrier of entry for investing in a show is so high, the world of Broadway investors is one where everybody knows everybody. Thus, when these four investors swept in, many were perplexed because they were names that they had never heard of before. The situation became even more suspicious when, just three days from the start of rehearsal, the production was dealing with the fallout of two huge problems. The elusive lead investor had been deemed dead under bizarre circumstances. 
just as bizarrely, an investor who had read of this fellow's demise in the New York Times and who had pledged the show $2 million to replace that investment had just been scared off by a series of eerie emails sent by two mysterious sources. The walls are about to cave in on Mr. Sprecher and the Rebecca Broadway production. The only reason to invest in Rebecca would be for um, a tax write-off or to get caught up in a federal trial. It was this chaos that had led federal defense attorney Ronald G. Russo here to a meeting at Schubert Alley with his client, producer and longtime family friend, Ben Sprecher. In his nearly 40 year career, Russo had never seen a case like this. Sure, Broadway had always lent itself towards the dramatic, but this was on a different level. What the, the hell, hell is going, going on? on? It was the question that dominated the meeting. What was the true story involving the deceased phantom investor and his three peculiar associates? What the, what the hell, hell, hell is going, going on? on? Who sent the foreboding emails that made the angel investor back out? What the hell is, what the hell is going, going on? on? How could a show six years in the making, on which so many people depended on for their livelihoods, come crashing down in just a single day? What the hell, what the hell, hell is going, going, going on? on? It was Russo's job to find out. If someone had a problem they needed to clean up, the no-nonsense lawyer from Brooklyn was the one to do it. Russo graduated from St. John's University School of Law in 1973, eventually making a name for himself as a federal prosecutor and being named the chief of official corruption and special prosecutions. It was here that Russo was introduced to the world of white collar crime. White collar crime is typically a financial crime. It's typically committed without violence. I've, I've, I've had double murder cases too, but that's not my meat and potatoes. By 1982, Russo had been prosecuting cases for nearly five years. And as was fairly typical at the time, he chose to open his own law firm. Only now, instead of going after the white collar criminals, he would navigate to the other side of the courtroom to defend them. This is where he would stay for the next 30 years, until September of 2012, when he received a phone call from producer and family friend, Ben Sprecher. Ben's message was distraught. Following the death of the show's lead investor, three close associates had become wary and had withdrawn their investments from his most recent project, Rebecca the Musical. Ben called me and said, can you do anything? Can you sue these people and get them to, uh, to pay me? To, to, can we enforce the contract that they have to invest in, the, in, in, in Rebecca? And I said to him, quite whimsically, Ben, I don't do that. There are lawyers at my firm if you want me to put you in touch with them. But why don't you give me a call when the FBI comes? Jokingly. 25 days later, FBI agents entered Ben Sprecher's office. The reason? It appeared that Rebecca had been murdered by a million dollar fraudster, and producer Sprecher was suspected of having played a role. Given the chaos that would come to ensue, it's difficult to imagine that things weren't always so dramatic for Rebecca. In the late 1990s, lyricist Michael Kunza was riding high off the success of three original musicals he had created with his musical partner, Sylvester LeVay. Kunza's career began as a music producer in Los Angeles. Given all the musical talent he met with on a daily basis, it seemed almost inevitable that he would meet LeVay in the 1970s. It wasn't long until Kunza realized that not only was LeVay great company, he was also a fabulous composer. The two would team up and find great success in the burgeoning disco scene, dominating the Billboard Top 100 two decades earlier, in November and December of 1975, with their hit song, Fly Robin Fly. And yet, despite having churned out hit after hit, the job of a music producer proved to be a lonely one for Kunza. The endless hours in the studio away from his family had left him creatively and emotionally bankrupt. 
Kunza reached his breaking point in the early 1980s, when he made a spur-of-the-moment decision to cancel all his producing contracts and essentially run away with the circus, becoming a German translator for hit musicals of Andrew Lloyd Webber. After translating shows like Evita, Lloyd Webber's frequent collaborator Hal Prince encouraged Kunza to stop doing adaptations and to finally write something of his own. Rediscovering his creative spark, Kunza teamed up once again with composer LeVay to create their 1992 smash, Elizabeth Das Musical, a dramatic take on the life and death of Empress Elizabeth of Austria. The piece proved important for highlighting the two central themes that would come to dominate Kunza's work, a strong central character growing up and claiming their emotional independence. Given his affinity for these themes, it seemed only natural that one of Kunza's favorite books growing up was Daphne du Maurier's gothic thriller, Rebecca. The Selznick studio successor to Gone with the Wind, Rebecca, brought to the screen with all the warmth and emotion that made millions of readers acclaim Daphne du Maurier's bestseller as the most exciting love story of our time. The fascinating Max de Winter lives on the screen in the person of Laurence Olivier. Why, it's Max de Winter. How do you do? The shy, unsophisticated young girl who dared to follow in the footsteps of the beautiful Rebecca is portrayed by lovely Joan Fontaine. How could I ask you to love me when I knew you loved Rebecca still? Du Maurier was a master storyteller, with her books typically centering on female protagonists. In the late 1930s, the writing process for her newest novel was not going smoothly, with Du Maurier tearing up her first 15,000 words in disgust. Conversely, her editor had a vastly different experience, being completely enraptured by what she had written thus far. The story of Rebecca is one riddled with twists and turns that masterfully walks the line between high suspense and high romance, going from Cinderella story to true crime thriller in a single flip of the page. The story follows a young nameless woman who falls in love with a mysterious man well outside her social class named Maxim de Winter. All that's known initially is that he's a withdrawn widower mourning the loss of his wife Rebecca. The young woman eventually reciprocates Maxim's advances, and they wed. Despite the new couple's initial happiness, everything changes once they return to Maxim's mysterious estate of Manderlei. The phantom-like presence of Maxim's deceased wife Rebecca is inescapable to the young nameless woman, who feels she can never compete with her utter perfection, a feeling that's only amplified once she meets the eerie housekeeper, Mrs. Danvers. Initially, the reason for Rebecca's death is believed to be an accidental drowning, but as the story progresses, the circumstances become murky. Page by page, it's revealed that no one is as innocent as they appear to be. Maxim, in particular. When it comes to Rebecca's death, the widower is slowly revealed to be the prime suspect. In addition to his sudden violent outbursts, the housekeeper, Mrs. Danvers, suddenly becomes unhinged due to a blind jealousy and obsessive mourning for Rebecca. This leads Maxim's new nameless bride on a journey of fighting to protect Maxim, as well as to find her own identity, separate from that of his former wife. It's believed that the story drew closely to the same feelings of jealousy Du Maurier felt in her own life feelings that she would never be able to compare with her husband's first true love, Joan Ricardo, especially after finding out that he had kept her old love letters, all of which bore a beautiful, sweeping R. The book became an immediate bestseller when it was released in 1938, spawning a movie adaptation two years later. The picture, which starred Laurence Olivier, Joan Fontaine, and Judith Anderson, marked a spectacular American debut for film director Alfred Hitchcock, ultimately winning two Academy Awards for Best Cinematography and Best Picture, the only Hitchcock film ever to do so. After finding the book following a reorganization of his home library, Kunza was once again reminded of the love he felt for the highly romantic story. He wanted to bring it to the stage. Upon expressing this desire, 
Many of Kunz's colleagues scoffed at the idea. You can't do a crime story on stage. But to him, Rebecca was more than just a crime story. It was a high drama romance, documenting a young woman's embrace of her true strength and self-worth. Kunza journeyed to De Maurier's home of Cornwall, England, in an attempt to acquire the rights to Rebecca from her son, Christian Frederick Browning. Other writers had made a similar trip, only to come home empty-handed, and it seemed as though Kunza was about to suffer a similar fate. It was only after attending a performance of Elizabeth in Vienna that Christian sensed his mother's story would be in safe hands. Nearly 20 years later, Du Maurier herself couldn't have conjured up a mystery like the one Ron Russo now faced. The collapse of Rebecca's Broadway transfer took with it the hopes, dreams, and security for the cast and crew who had prepared to invest their lives towards it. With as disastrous an effect as that, it was never an option for Russo to not find the person responsible. But before he could do that, he needed a list of suspects. The Angel Investor's one request had been to remain anonymous, and the production had done a good job of keeping his identity and personal information confidential. There had been no known leaks, meaning it was more than likely that the emails had come from somebody working on the inside. Was it the director, Francesca Zambello? The business liaison, Mark Houghton? Or maybe Sprecher had been double-crossed by his producing partner, Louise Forlenza? There were so many possibilities. But it just didn't make sense to Russo. Why would someone willingly attempt to sabotage the show they were working on? Could someone have been paid off? Was it a case of blind ego? Or could it have been that this angel investor had been a ploy in a much larger scheme? Could it be that the person pulling the strings was the same person behind the mysterious death of the show's first investor? Despite the possible suspects, there was still one person that many people were suspicious of above all else. Russo's own client and family friend, Ben Sprecher. When it came to Broadway, Ben Sprecher was ready to be a somebody. The son of a pharmacist and a high school teacher, Sprecher mirrored countless other ambitious dreamers when he moved to New York in the 1970s, with the dream of becoming a Broadway producer. By the early 1990s, he was the manager and owner of three off-Broadway houses, but he always knew that if he really wanted to make it in the big leagues, he needed to make the jump towards Broadway. This was proving to be much more difficult than he had anticipated. The barrier of entry for becoming a lead Broadway producer is incredibly high, with those who are most successful typically either being independently wealthy outside of the theater world or having a big enough pool of wealthy investors that they can call on. Sprecher had neither, leading many in the industry to cast him out as someone who didn't have the clout to be viewed as a serious force to be reckoned with. To them, he was just another theater owner with dreams of grandeur. But Sprecher knew he had potential. He could see it, and he was ready to make the others see it as well. All he needed was a really great show. And in the mid-2000s, she found him. The Viennese air was abuzz with anticipation in September of 2006, as Rebecca prepared for its opening night. The story had been given new life, in a stunning stage production infinitely beyond what Kunza could have imagined during the first London workshop two years prior. In initial readings, the show was charming in its modesty. Kunza and LeVay had crafted a handful of lavish, sweeping musical compositions, but the show's true strength came from its heart. Underneath Rebecca's beautiful melodies was a creator who had a genuine connection and reverence for the story. The overwhelming potential of the show gripped the imagination of director Francesca Zambello. So much so, that following the first reading, she pulled Michael Kunza aside and said, If you do ever bring Rebecca to the stage, let me direct it. 
Zambello is a type of theatrical hybrid, possessing a blend of old-school professionalism and an enthusiastic, inventive eclecticness. As the show prepped for its opening night, the decision to bring Zambello on board as a director had proved to be an inspired one. As she faithfully elevated the gothic universe of Daphne du Maurier to meet the high stakes required for the stage. The show glimmered in the fairy dust of the 1980s mega musical, having been infused with the high stakes drama and theatrical spectacle that had made shows by the likes of Andrew Lloyd Webber commercial juggernauts. This influence was on full display during the show's climax, that was guaranteed to leave audiences speechless. In the book and the film, the ending sees Maxim's dreamlike estate of Manderley burnt to the ground by an unhinged Mrs. Danvers. The book took a more reserved approach in this depiction, using the phrase, The sky on the horizon was not dark at all. It was shot with crimson, like a splash of blood, and the ashes blew towards us with the salt wind from the sea. Whereas the Hitchcock film decided to really milk the grand finale for a shocking, flame-infested crescendo. The musical would double down on this spectacle, setting a colossal central spiral staircase on fire, with Kunza and LeVay's pounding and frantic music layered over top, building and building until the flames became too much, forcing the gigantic staircase to collapse into the stage in real time. The majesty of the finale was enough to make the phantom chandelier blush, and left the opening night crowd speechless. Specifically, an up-and-coming producer named Louise Forlenza. So much so that the very next day, she phoned her business partner, Ben Sprecher, and told him, Holy shit! You have to see this production! Three weeks later, Sprecher was in the Raymond Theater himself experiencing the same overwhelming feelings as for Lenza and many other stunned patrons. Sprecher couldn't believe that other producers and theater owners weren't chomping at the bits to produce this in New York. In Sprecher's eyes, he had finally found the keys to his mandrelay. But in that blind confidence towards the show's future success, he had no way of seeing the crimson sky that was rolling in from behind. Ron Russo cruised down the Southern State Parkway on Saturday, September 29th, wondering how Rebecca could have fallen so far off the tracks. All he had to work off was a string of emails, a few investor subscription agreements, and a dead investor who, for all intents and purposes, seemed to be as much of a ghost as Rebecca herself. At the same time, a steady stream of shocking and oftentimes accusatory information was being released by Patrick Healy of the New York Times and Michael Riedel of the New York Post. The two journalists were engaged in a rivalry of revelation as the pair competed to see who could crack the next layer of the Rebecca mystery, one-upping each other with a new astounding headline each day. Though the writing may have been different, the question was still the same. Who was this mysterious dead investor? And did he even exist? The deeper Healy and Riedel dug into the story, the more perplexing it became. Despite the investor contributing a substantial amount to the production, producers Ben Sprecher and Louise Forlenza had never met the man in person, having only ever corresponded with him via email. To the reporters and many people in the industry, all signs were pointing towards this investor being a made-up specter. The gossip reached a fever pitch as everyone tried to figure out who would invent a fake investor and why. Naturally, all fingers began to point towards the only person who desperately needed the credibility of a big-name investor in order to attract others. Producer Ben Sprecher. With the ever-growing list of postponements for Rebecca, he and Forlenza were getting accustomed to the icy breeze of doors being repeatedly slammed in their faces. 
many veteran investors felt that a gothic mystery novel wouldn't become a blockbuster. But it was exactly this premise that made the producers so sure of its success, especially after winning the rights for the show's English translation in the late 2000s. The duo was riding high that first year. The two upstarts with no Broadway experience were somehow able to beat out established theater professionals like Andrew Lloyd Webber. In 2009, enthusiasm towards the project was rising, with publicist Mark Thibodeau releasing a flurry of backstage updates about exciting new additions to the creative team, including God of Carnage translator Christopher Hampton. To direct, Sprecher and Ferlenza recruited Michael Blakemore. It was an impressive get, considering he was the only person ever to win two Tony Awards for Best Direction in the same season, one for the play, Copenhagen, and one for the musical, Kiss Me Kate. Francesca Zambello would agree to come on board as a co-director. The exact reason for this varies depending on who's asked. To the producers, they believed Zambello had done such a masterful job of bringing the show to life in Vienna that it only made sense to have her bring it to Broadway. However, they also needed Blakemore to help the show move more ticket sales. However, Zambello remembered it differently, stating that she had been the one they were counting on to drive more ticket sales. According to Zambello, she agreed to come on board after the producers approached her, stating their need for a big-name director. The contrasting storylines highlight the relationship between Zambello and the producers which had always been tumultuous drenched in suspicion and an underlying animosity that had spawned from a production of Little House on the Prairie the Musical in 2008. The musical had opened to rave reviews, and almost immediately got offered the chance to transfer directly to Broadway. But, much to the aggravation of Zambello, the offer was rejected. Sprecher claimed that the reason he turned down the offer was because the show had always been intended to be a traveling show. Zambello, on the other hand, speculated it was because of another reason. Sprecher couldn't raise the money. I always thought Ben was a shyster. Him and Florenza never really could get the money. They didn't have the clout. It was always, this is wrong, or that's wrong. But it was never, let's go get the money then. They were just bold-faced liars. Ben always lied about the money. He was a sham artist, and he got caught. Russo slowly navigated the pocket-sized parking lot of the Olympic Diner. There was no denying that the theory of Sprecher creating a fake investor could have been entirely plausible. However, Russo had become a pretty good judge of character. After spending so many years defending clients who were clearly guilty, he could also tell when they were innocent. While the papers had Sprecher as the only suspect, Russo was interested in learning more about another. The show's business liaison, Mark Houghton. Following their explosive meeting in Schubert Alley, Russo asked Sprecher to give Houghton a call. Taking over the phone, Russo told Houghton that he'd like to meet with him. Working with criminals for as long as he had, Russo was expecting Houghton to attempt to somehow weasel himself out of a meeting. What he wasn't expecting was the enthusiastic response he got back. Okay, let's get breakfast. The self-proclaimed home of the world's best salad dressing, the Olympic Diner had become a favorite spot for Houghton. The shabby 1980s exterior offering a striking juxtaposition to his $40,000 Rolex watch, custom tailored suit, and greased back hair. He was a stockbroker who had obviously done very well for himself, periodically wasting his days away either on the golf course or on board his private yacht, modestly named the Hot Catch. Russo found his way into the crowded diner alongside colleague, private investigator Tom Kelly, and his client, producer Ben Sprecher, eventually sitting down across from a cool and haughty Houghton. The cocky demeanor had a different flavor than it had five months earlier, when Louise Ferlenza met Houghton for the first time at the Garden City Hotel. Having professed the show's unfortunate string of bad luck, 
Producer for Lenza waited with bated breath to hear Houghton's response. Shortly after securing the rights in 2008, Sprecher and Forlenza decided the best first step would be to give the show a test run on the West End in 2011, and a Toronto run in October of 2012. The fear of the magical show being lost in translation was a constant one for lyricist Michael Kunza. His last work to receive the Broadway transfer treatment was a musical called Dance of the Vampires. An all in all, dreadful experience, which, in Kunza's words, had saw his book be mutilated without his knowledge. Kunza felt betrayed, and the failure of dance was one he wasn't prepared to make again, meaning this time he would be all in on the process of Rebecca, to ensure nothing would get by him. He had originally written an English libretto as a reference piece for American director Francesca Zambello, and Kunza was immensely proud of the work that he and translator Christopher Hampton had created. The language might have been different, but the heart of the story was still the same. By the time the show's first reading in London took place, Kunza and LeVay felt confident in the decision they made to entrust Rebecca to Sprecher and Forlenza. They had a large list of talented stars interested, a stellar creative team, and, most importantly, they had a theatre to stage the show. The Shaftesbury Theatre in London might have been immaculate, but it still required a major overhaul to bring the extravagant world of Rebecca to life. The team knew that the most technically complex moment was going to come from the grand staircase of Manderley's fiery descent into the stage. To make the moment work artistically, a crew needed to dig underneath the theater to create a trap door large enough for the stairs to sink into. Once exploratory excavations began to see if the site was safe, teams were perplexed to see their test hole flooded with water in a matter of seconds. In the production's first perplexing twist, it was revealed that the excavation crews had unearthed a hidden ancient stream, untouched by the hands of time for generations. The unforeseen discovery turned the show's central set piece into a central headache. Should the crew continue the excavation, not only would they be in danger of flooding the entire theater, they would also be forced to cease all operations were they to uncover any ancient artifacts. Sprecher and Forlenza had two options for how to proceed. Either nix the staircase, or nix the show. In a somewhat bewildering move, Sprecher announced in December of 2012 that Rebecca would no longer open in the West End. To him, the $3 million staircase collapse at the end was too pivotal to the show's success that cutting or downsizing it would have completely robbed the show of its artistic integrity. But when the Schuberts offered him the Broadhurst Theater on Broadway, and a $500,000 investment, he suddenly wasn't so attached to the staircase anymore. The Schuberts' investment, mixed with a planned $5 million contribution from a real estate developer named Norton Herrick, filled Sprecher with enough confidence that by July of 2011, he announced that Rebecca would be opening in the spring of 2012 on Broadway potentially bringing some much-needed competition to the second half of a season that had been high in drama, but sparse in new musicals. Come November, everything seemed to be going better than expected. Rebecca leaned even more into its goal of becoming the next Phantom of the Opera, going so far as casting Sierra Bogus and Tam Mudu, alumnus from the sequel musical Love Never Dies, as I and Maxim Du Winter, and taking up residence in the Broadhurst Theatre, which was directly next door to the Majestic, which had housed the high drama romance for roughly 24 years. The smooth sailing towards an April 2012 opening hit an unexpected financial iceberg in December. Despite having spent $250,000 to draft subscription documents that appealed to Norton Herrick's requests, for reasons still unknown, he got cold feet and decided at the last minute to scale down his investment from seven figures to six. The news was a major setback. By this point, the production had already spent $1.4 million on preliminary production costs and set construction, and the economy was still reeling from the Great Recession. Soon enough, Sprecher and Ferlenza once again found themselves short 
of their $12 million goal. In January of 2012, the duo were left with no choice. They had to postpone the show again. The announcement of a new opening in fall of 2012 knocked it out of Tony contention for the 2011-2012 season, which was increasingly picking up speed. It was an extremely frustrating blow for the original creative team. The sets were made and in storage, the 130-person cast and crew was established, and they were ready to bring the show to life in America, only to keep getting sidelined by the lack of funding. The situation was exceptionally aggravating for co-director Francesca Zambello, as her resentment and suspicion towards Brecker rose with each passing day. It was this financial shortcoming that had led Forlenza to the hotel one February morning in 2012, to sit across from the man she was now hoping would be the key to opening the gates of Manderley. Forlenza was a well-connected accountant, and it was through the friend of one of her clients that she was introduced to Mark Houghton. The world of theater wasn't completely foreign to the former stockbroker, who said he had friends that had invested in shows on the West End and who had managed to come out unscathed. Ultimately, Sprecher and Forlenza would agree to bring Houghton on, agreeing to pay him 8% commission on any amounts of money he brought in over $250,000 and a $7,500 fee that would be endorsed by his company, Trinity Management. It wouldn't be long until the bet on Houghton would lead them to the jackpot when he revealed that he had not just one, but a group of four British investors lined up. The amount they'd be willing to give? 4.5 million dollars. After a few email exchanges and phone calls with the prospective investors, the duo were ecstatic to receive four signed subscription agreements agreeing to invest in the show. Rebecca could officially open. Three investors named Roger Thomas, Julian Spencer, and Walter Timmons agreed to provide a combined $2.5 million, while their lead associate would chip in $2 million himself. The astronomical amount would come from a wealthy South African businessman. His name? Paul Abrams. As the silverware in the Olympic diner clanged throughout the place, Russo couldn't figure Mark Houghton out. As the man seated across from him shoved his hash browns and eggs into his mouth, Russo was taken aback at how nonchalant Houghton was. After everything that had happened during the last week of September 2012, and the disastrous effects it had had on the show, how could he seem so unbothered? Watching him in the Olympic diner alongside an uneasy Sprecher and a rigid private detective Tom Kelly, Russo wasn't so sure what to believe anymore. Common sense would tell him that Houghton had obviously played some role in the financing falling through. But if that was actually the case, why had Houghton so willingly suggested meeting for breakfast? What type of sociopath would throw himself right into the lion's mouth if he was a fraud? Though Sprecher and Forlenza continued to reassure everyone on the team that they had the money from the four British investors, by April of 2012, after multiple postponements and losses of funding, the creative team had no reason to view their promises as anything other than empty. The uncertainty of the show ultimately proved to be too much for lead actors Sierra Bagas and Tam Mudu, ultimately deciding to leave the production that same month. Houghton himself flew to London to meet with Abrams in person as a way to put the finishing touches on the deal. The next month, Rebecca's opening date of November 18th, 2012 was officially announced and the tickets went on sale three weeks later. While the producers were expecting an enthusiastic response, they weren't expecting to reach an advance of roughly $1 million so quickly. People were ready to experience Rebecca on the Great White Way. Around this same time, the show's longtime publicist Mark Thibodeau would sign an official agreement agreeing to go on salary and contract that September as Rebecca's publicist. Thibodeau was a well-regarded publicist amongst Broadway elites, 
being a member of the Broadway press teams for 1987's Les Mis, 1988's Phantom of the Opera, and 2003's Wicked. Thibodeau started representing Rebecca in the beginning of 2008, sticking by the show's side through the numerous postponements and recastings. Come June 20th of 2012, things were looking up as the last piece of the show's puzzle was solved with the announcement that actress Jill Pace and actor Ryan Silverman would be cast as the new I and Maxim D. Winter, respectively. After all the chaos the production had seen for the past four years, it seemed that maybe, just maybe, Rebecca was finally on track to open on Broadway. July was a relatively calm month. Zambello and Blakemore discussed the best way to translate the majesty of the German production in a way that was digestible for US audiences. Pace and Silverman were hard at work trying to solve how to bring a more human side to the lead lovers, and Michael Kunza continued to refine the piece remotely, from exotic locations like London, Hamburg, and Vienna. While everything was moving along efficiently on the creative front, by the end of the month, Sprecher and Forlenza were getting increasingly concerned. It had been roughly five months since Paul Abrams and his three associates had agreed to fill the 4.5 million hole in funding. And the most the producers had gotten were a few email exchanges, a signed subscription agreement, an introduction to Abrams' niece a few months prior, and stories of an African safari he and Houghton had taken while he had visited him in London. What they didn't have was a finalized money transfer, and rehearsals were set to begin in two months. Suspicions surrounding the three investors started to grow. Possessing a background in not-for-profit theater, co-director Francesca Zambello knew how difficult it was to bring investors on board to a show, typically needing to be invested spiritually and artistically long before they invest financially. To have an investor agree to put up $2 million out of nowhere rubbed her the wrong way. If that kind of investor really existed, other people would have known that investor. Sprecher upped the pressure on Houghton to get the group to release the funds. And in the last week of that month, Houghton responded with a forwarded email from the assistant of lead investor Paul Abrams. In a dramatic turn of events, the consequential investor had fallen gravely ill. Abrams, and the show itself, were now clinging on for dear life. Rebecca was less than two months to rehearsals beginning, and the show's main lifeline was in jeopardy. During a trip to Africa, $2.5 million investor Paul Abrams had been infected with malaria. Having never met the man, and seeing as the relationship was primarily fostered by Houghton, Sprecher and Forlenza had no direct way of getting in contact with Abrams themselves. Knowing that their entire show was on the line, the duo continuously pestered Houghton for updates. The messages coming out of London were optimistic about Abrams' medical state. Holding his own. Still in ICU, but okay. The days would pass, with Sprecher and Forlenza constantly wanting to know what was going on. What they weren't expecting was the next update they got from Jessica on August 5th, 2012. I'm sorry to relay such terrible news. Mr. Abrams passed away this evening and the family has asked for your attendance at the services. Upon reading the email, the color left Sprecher and Forlenza's faces, leaving them looking like they had just seen Paul Abrams' ghost. Frantically, Houghton tried to ease the pair's anxieties, hopping on a plane to London to try to save the show-making deal from falling through. A flurry of emails began between Houghton and Abrams' executor of estate, a man who went by the ambiguous name of Mr. Wexler. In the span of roughly three weeks, Rebecca had gone from announcing exciting Manderley-themed giveaways for the show's opening to now seriously questioning whether an opening would happen at all. Following Abrams' death, his three partners pulled their investments as well. And once again, the $4.5 million hole reared its ugly head. This time, 
the show didn't have the luxury of time it had had back in London. With rehearsals slated to begin on September 10th, there was no way the show would fill the hole in time. They had to delay the production. Again. Come September 1st, Sprecher made an emotional phone call to family friend Ron Russo, asking if there was any way they could sue the three living investors for not following through on their subscription agreements. Ben, I don't do that. There are lawyers at my firm if you want me to put you in touch with them. But why don't you give me a call when the FBI comes? Five days following this on September 6th, publicist Mark Thibodeau was summoned to Ferlenz's apartment, where he was informed of Paul Abrams' death, drafting up a press release that would be posted two days later on September 8th. Important info. Due to the tragic death of one of our investors, rehearsals have been delayed. Later that day, rumblings began in the theater community following New York Times journalist Patrick Healy's report on the matter on Artsbeat, an online blog connected to the Times. Healy cited numerous areas of concern, from the lack of a name for the investor, to the chairman of the Schubert organization, Philip J. Smith, stating, I've been around here since 1950, and I've never seen a scenario quite like what's happened to Rebecca. Evidently, the lawyers for the estate seem to be cooperating, but let's face it, there's a short window of time for this to be resolved. To make matters worse, Sprecher falsely claimed to have flown to London to talk to Abrams' estate himself. What the hell is going on? The mysterious surroundings of the suddenly deceased investor raised the alarm bells for publicist Mark Thibodeau as he began getting phone call after phone call from the New York Times, looking to answer the big question. Who was the mystery investor? And did he even exist? To Healy, it was clear that someone wasn't being honest. The question was, who? The Artsbeat blog post only added to the stress plaguing Sprecher. The controversy was the last thing he needed as he desperately tried to figure out how he could possibly fulfill the roughly $4.5 million hole in less than a month. Thankfully, business liaison Mark Houghton had a possible solution a $1.1 million bridge loan would help them at least partially fill the gap. The only thing needed was collateral. Holding such a strong belief in the show, Houghton, Sprecher, and Forlenza all agreed to put their own houses on the line to secure the loan. Once again, the production was close to securing the amount needed to get rehearsals and theater construction underway. But they were still roughly $2.5 million too short. Then, on Tuesday, September 11th, 2012, Sprecher's fortune seemed to pull through once again, after receiving an email from a man named Lawrence Runsdorf. I read about your production in the New York Times, and that one of your investors passed away. Perhaps I can become an investor and at least partially delay your downfall. Sprecher was skeptical, but after offering Runsdorf his phone number and conversing with him over the line, Sprecher was soon in an office on 42nd Street, shaking hands with the mysterious man. The owner of a Florida pharmaceutical company sat back and listened to a sweating and panting Ben Sprecher, who had just sprinted halfway across Manhattan to meet him. The exhausted Sprecher passionately laid out the beauty of Rebecca, the success it had had around the globe, and the huge upside potential it had to be a hit. By the time all was said and done, Runsdorf was so impressed that he agreed to take the position of the deceased Abrams and to invest $2.25 million of his own dollars into the production on three conditions. One, he needed to have his attorneys review the documentation. Two, he needed his attorney to negotiate a separate co-producer credit. This would help set forth his additional rights and entitlements. And three, his identity needed to remain anonymous. Runstorf had never invested in a Broadway musical before, and if it got out that he had invested the sum he was about to, then every producer in town would hound him. And just like that, Sprecher had somehow filled the multi-million dollar hole yet again.
Meanwhile, New York Times journalist Patrick Healy's hunt for the dead investor continued to intensify, placing calls to many of the crew members involved in the production. With little cooperation from the production staff, all Healy had to work with now was a name. Paul Abrams. Diving into the records, Healy was surprised that for as highly regarded a businessman as Abrams had purported to be, nobody seemed to know if this guy existed. In addition to that, none of the producers had ever met him, and the email account for his executor of his state, Mr. Wexler, had only been created a month prior. Healy was in the risky and difficult position of trying to prove a negative in saying that Abrams didn't exist. His evidence was strong, but the possibility that somebody could pop out of the woodwork was still incredibly high. The Artbeat blog was one thing, but to run a story in print with a circulation of nearly 2 million people, a wrong educated guess would utterly destroy his reputation. In a bold move, Healy released a front page article in the New York Times on September 25th, 2012, titled Rebecca Sees Investor Fade As If Dreamt, in which he detailed the bizarre findings, or lack thereof, surrounding investor Paul Abrams. While the article would send shockwaves through the theater world, the cast and crew directly involved with Rebecca by and large dismissed it. They had already signed their year-long contracts. Michael Kunza was relieved that the concepts remained closely tied to the German production, and many actors were ready to cement their Broadway legacies. Anyway, the press had been obsessed with Rebecca ever since Bogus had left the production back in April. So to the cast and crew, they viewed the article as just another attempt to take down the show, dismissing it as free publicity. There was no possible way Healy's findings could be true. How could an investor just not exist? This was still a question that weighed heavily on publicist Mark Thibodeau's mind, despite being told by the producers not to dive into it. To Sprecher and Forlenza, the conflict involving Paul Abrams was better left in the past, informing Thibodeau that they had found a new investor in Lawrence Runsdorf. Even though the cast and crew might not have been interested in the Patrick Healy article, a certain government agency was. On September 26th, defense attorney Ronald Russo got another concerning call from Sprecher. The FBI was officially involved. And now, so was Russo. They entered Sprecher's office and requested any and all paperwork relating to Paul Abrams. After reading the New York Times article, the FBI was having an equally difficult time IDing the stiff. It seemed that Paul Abrams and the three other British investors had been created as a part of an elaborate con, and producer Ben Sprecher was their main suspect. Being a criminal defense attorney, Russo rarely believed everything his clients would tell him. But it seemed bizarre to him that if Sprecher had created these fake investors, why would he have asked for help suing them just a few weeks prior? Russo reached out to the FBI agents, telling them he wanted to go over the agreements himself before turning them over. Combing through them with a fine-tooth comb, the subscriptions appeared to be entirely legitimate. After reading through the email correspondence between Sprecher and the investors, it seemed clear to Russo that the investors did exist. This revelation did little to relieve Sprecher's anxiety, however. He still needed to get to opening night. September 28th was the day Rebecca would officially be saved. The bridge loan and Runsdorf's money transfer were nearly finalized. Kunza had flown into New York City, and an entire floor in the 42nd Street Studios was ready to bring Rebecca to life. Down the street, the broad sweeping R maintained its phantom-like presence on the theater district. The $1.1 million bridge loan that Houghton had set up was entering its final stages. Sprecher and Forlenza had both given the underwriters the titles to their homes. The only one they still needed to supply was for Houghton. As the pair raced towards his Long Island home, they both breathed an excited sigh of relief. After four years of setbacks, postponements, and delays, Sprecher and Forlenza were finally on track to open their first Broadway show. 
a show that they both firmly believed was going to change Broadway forever. An elated Sprecher pressed the pedal to the metal to get Houghton's title, anxiously awaiting confirmation from Runstorf's lawyers that his $2.25 million wire transfer had gone through. Just then, Forlenza received a notification. It was an email from Runstorf's attorney, Scott Lazarus. This was the moment the pair had been waiting for. As Forlenza began reading the email aloud, their hearts began to sink. The email wasn't directly from Lazarus. Instead, it was a forwarded email Runstorf had received that morning from a mysterious woman named Sarah Finkelstein. The walls are about to cave in on Mr. Sprecher and the Rebecca Broadway production. The email was the last in a series of three, which were sent to Runstorf and his two lawyers. The first email, under the name Bethany Walsh, was sent to one lawyer on September 25th, stating, You'd better read the Times. The next day, on September 26th, Another of Rundorf's lawyers received a cautionary email in which Walsh detailed the findings of a recently published article from Michael Riedel of the New York Post. The third email, sent from a Sarah Finkelstein, went to Rundorf on September 27th. It highlighted the same findings while also sending a revelatory and disturbing message. The walls are about to cave in on Mr. Sprecher and the entire Rebecca production. It is a near certainty that the man, Paul Abrams, was made up several months ago to defraud other investors. As a placeholder to give them a sense of security, as well as the owners of the theater, the Schuberts, while Mr. Sprecher continued to try and raise money. When that money wasn't raised by August, Mr. Sprecher or someone associated with him came up with the story that Paul Abrams had died. Mr. Sprecher hasn't been able to come up with any information to prove that Paul Abrams was a real person. In fact, any information he has provided has proven to be extremely suspicious. It is inevitable that the truth will come out in a matter of days or weeks that the Paul Abrams story was definitively made up. And at that point, there will be charges of fraud, lawsuits, etc. The only reason to invest in Rebecca would be for a tax write-off or to get caught up in a federal trial. In addition to the distressing contents, what was more concerning was that it had been sent directly to Runstorf himself. This meant that somebody knew he was directly involved, and his request to remain anonymous had been breached. And so, on September 28, 2012, Lawrence Runstorp withdrew his $2.25 million investment, just three days before Rebecca's rehearsals were set to begin. Outside a McDonald's parking lot, Producer Ben Sprecher stepped outside his car into the pouring rain and cried towards the heavens. They had lost the funding again. A visibly distressed Ben Sprecher sat at a table in the Olympic diner, sat in between a rigid private investigator Tom Kelly and an utterly unimpressed Ron Russo, staring at the former stockbroker seated across from them. The emails had made a bold declaration that Sprecher had created the investor Paul Abrams, but business liaison Mark Houghton continued to assert that Abrams was real, going so far as to reference photos of the two together on Abrams' private plane. But Russo had represented the Mark Houghtons of the world long enough that he knew he was full of it from the second he opened his mouth. To Russo, the question was no longer if Houghton had played a role in the creation of the fake investor Paul Abrams. It was whether or not Houghton had used the email sent to real investor Lawrence Runsdorf as a way to frame Sprecher. As the breakfast came to an end, Houghton stood up and gave Ben Sprecher a hug. Sprecher didn't know what to think. How could this man who had been so helpful 
and who he had trusted not be who he thought he was. After Houghton left, private investigator Tom Kelly told Sprecher plainly, I think you've been the victim of a fraud. Russo and Sprecher walked out from the diner, driving straight to a scheduled meeting in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. Bringing a client directly to a meeting like this was dangerous, because there was no telling what the special prosecutor had on Sprecher. Upon arriving, Russo told the federal prosecutor that they had just come from a meeting with Mark Houghton, to which she responded, You did what? Don't you know that's a crime? Russo was confused. That's our witness. It turns out that Mark Houghton hadn't gotten his lavish lifestyle from managing stocks and bonds, but rather from conducting a series of elaborate, multi-million dollar frauds. As Russo looked deeper into the subscription papers, he sent agents to the London addresses listed, only to reveal that they belonged to a slew of abandoned buildings. To Russo, there was now no question about it. Abrams and the three investors didn't exist. And when it came to Lawrence Runstorff and the mysterious emails, Mark Houghton was suspect number one. Later that day, Sprecher was dealt another blow after receiving an email from publicist Mark Thibodeau, informing him that he was leaving the production. You've been nothing but a good guy to me. And I know what an incredibly difficult time this has been for you. And I really hope it can somehow still work out. But for my own well-being, I just can't be part of this anymore. Sprecher understood. But before letting Thibodeau walk away, he needed him to do one last thing. They needed to issue a press release letting the world know Rebecca would not be opening. On September 30th, 2012, Michael Kunza enthusiastically prepared for the next step in bringing his beloved Rebecca to the stage. The day was a great one for Kunza, his excitement for the show growing with each hour that passed. He was finally going to be able to bring his true creative vision to Broadway. Kunza made his way to producer Ben Sprecher's office. The entire creative team, as well as a few senior cast members, including Karen Mason and Nick Wyman, had been called to discuss the future of the production. As the team all gathered, Ben slowly began to tell the entire story. He told them about Paul Abrams sweeping in to put in a large amount of money. He then told them about his unfortunate demise that led to the three other investors pulling out. He told them of Runstorf coming in to save the day, only to be scared off by a series of three mysterious emails. His presentation sounded so ridiculous, there was no way it could have been true. But while the story may have been unbelievable, the end result was even worse. Rebecca wasn't going to be able to open. The news came as a complete shock to everyone who was in the room, especially Kunza. Being a writer on the show, he wasn't interested in the financial side of things, only learning about the controversy with Abrams from reading the New York Times. Despite trying to stay as involved in the production as he could, his show had once again been taken away from him by sources he hadn't been able to spot. In his last act as a publicist for the production, Thibodeau released a blistering press release detailing that vicious emails filled with lies and innuendo had scared off their investment from an anonymous third party, with Sprecher himself stating, Why anyone would be so hateful and cruel and would go to such an amount of effort to uncover confidential information is something I am having a terrible time grasping. All that we have ever wanted to do is put on this amazing show. When it came to moving forward, Sprecher had only one order. They had to have at least one day of rehearsal so the cast could still get paid for their work. And more importantly, it would give him a chance to try to explain. Going 
Going into the day of the first rehearsal for Rebecca was meant to be a time of celebration for producer Ben Sprecher. But now it was a moment of stress-ridden dread. In just one week, the show that was intended to revolutionize the theater district had gone down in flames, taking 130 people down with it. The news was especially gut-wrenching for Pace, Soberman, and Mason, as their shot at headlining a Broadway theater in a show they had come to care about so deeply had suddenly vanished. Even though Sprecher, Ferlenza, and Blakemore tried to rally the troops with a rah-rah speech, everyone in the room knew the truth. Rebecca was dead for good. With nothing else to do, the cast and crew united in a moment of love and sadness to lament the show they had stood beside for years and how it had finally collapsed into oblivion. Strangely, in the crowd of bewildered and heartsick faces, there was one noticeably absent. Co-director Francesca Zambello. While everyone else was relayed the news in the rehearsal space, Zambello was informed by a phone call from her agent. Unbeknownst to the rest of the crew, when Paul Abrams entered the picture, Zambello had taken on another project. I was doing another show at the time because I never believed it was going to happen. I never felt right about it. A few months would pass, and the cast would find themselves performing at a fundraiser event for the show in Long Island, only to never talk of Rebecca again. Even though the show had no hopes of moving forward, Russo was still dedicated to solving who was responsible for its downfall. Who sent the emails that scared away real angel investor Larry Runsdorf? Who were Bethany Walsh and Sarah Finkelstein? Given the suspicion revolving around Houghton, Russo and his law firm sued him, as well as John Doe and Mary Doe. By suing the two suspected culprits, Russo was given the power to subpoena Google as a way to track down the IP addresses behind the three emails. As Google closed in on the IP addresses, it was determined that both accounts for Bethany Walsh and Sarah Finkelstein had been created during the last week of September. The same week those three emails had been sent. Runstorff's identity had been kept close to the chest, and the only one who could have possibly known his identity and contact information would have been someone close to the inside. Someone who, for one reason, whether professionally or personally motivated, didn't want to see the production succeed. Was it director Francesca Zambello seeking retribution against Sprecher? Was it Patrick Healy of the New York Times trying to stop Runstorff from falling into an assumed trap? Or was it Mark Houghton trying to place the blame on Sprecher so he could make a getaway? That first week of December, Russo finally received the document with the customer who was connected to the IP address. As he opened the report, a stunned Ron Russo took a bewildered step back. It was Mark. Thibodeau. Sprecher was floored as Ron Russo sat across from him in his office and broke the news. The person responsible for Rebecca's financial fallout was its own publicist? To one on the outside, it made no sense. But from the inside, it was a very different story. On September 6th, Mark Thibodeau was summoned to the apartment of Louise Forlenza. This was the first night that he learned of Mark Houghton and investor Paul Abrams, being told to write a press release announcing his passing and the rescheduling of the show. Being the fourth postponement, Thibodeau told Sprecher and Forlenza that the only way they would be able to weather the storm of negative publicity would be by being completely open and honest about what was going on. He drafted a press release directly stating that the investor, Paul Abrams, had passed away, and reached out to the duo seeking any information they had about the investor's life that he could include in the briefing. 
What he got back instead was both producers telling him to take out Abrams' name due to privacy concerns. The move was frustrating to Thibodeau, but in a way, he understood where the duo was coming from. That Saturday, September 8th, Thibodeau releases the press release announcing the postponement without featuring the investor's name. Important info. Due to the tragic death of one of our investors, rehearsals have been delayed. This vague announcement, in turn, sparks the interest of New York Times journalist Patrick Healy, leading to his article on the Artsbeat blog and his numerous attempts to get a comment on the mysterious dead investor from a member of the Rebecca production team. One of the people Healy reaches out to is Mark Thibodeau. Thibodeau spent the next two weeks approaching Sprecher about his continued suspicions of the dead investor. Every time he brought it up, however, he was told to let the story go, because their money issues were already solved. They told Thibodeau that they not only had a bridge loan being set up by Mark Houghton, but that they had also found a new investor to fill the $2.25 million hole, a man named Lawrence Runstorf. Still, Thibodeau's intrigue in Paul Abrams and Houghton himself persisted. The fact that Healy and many other producers in the industry weren't able to find any information on Paul Abrams made Thibodeau suspicious in his own right. However, unlike the others, Thibodeau actually had a place to begin his hunt, typing in a Google search for Mark Houghton, Long Island. What he uncovered was damning. The supposedly wealthy and successful businessman had several complaints and lawsuits against him for fraud. Following these revelations, Thibodeau scanned over Abrams' subscription agreement himself. At first glance, everything seemed to be in place, but upon closer inspection, he noticed that the phone number they had written down didn't lead anywhere. It was looking more and more like the producers had been conned. But even after bringing this compelling evidence up to Sprecher, he was forcefully shut down. Was Thibodeau on the trail of uncovering something he wasn't supposed to know? It was suspicious how the more facts he presented to Sprecher, the less inclined he was to listen to them. It was almost as if he were involved somehow. Sprecher was still new to the Broadway producing game. Was Abrams created as a way to entice more upper-end investors? Was Sprecher teaming up with Houghton to make off with the investors' money? There were too many scenarios, but none of them seemed to end well for the show's newest angel investor, Lawrence Runsdorf. Was Sprecher preparing to take Runsdorf for a ride as well? The possibility was one that haunted Thibodeau's conscience. The reason being that Thibodeau was indirectly responsible for the investor getting involved. The only reason Runsdorf had agreed to come on board was due to Patrick Healy's New York Times article in the Artsbeat blog, an article that was only written due to Thibodeau's press release on the death of Paul Abrams. The deadline for the wire transfer and the first day of rehearsals continued to inch closer. As Patrick Healy of the New York Times and Michael Riedel of the New York Post continued to release an ever-growing flood of accusations, including one with Sprecher lying about flying to London to deal with the Abrams estate, Thibodeau became even more confident that Sprecher was directly involved in the con. And so, in the last week of September, he decided to take matters into his own hands. Or rather, into the hands of Bethany Walsh. After creating a Gmail account in his apartment, Thibodeau visited a local coffee shop that had a pay-as-you-use computer to send an email to one of Runsdorf's lawyers in an attempt to stop the deal. He brought to light the same concerns he had found in his own investigations and made numerous references to the Healy article. No response. Thibodeau had only intended to send one email. But off the back of the first lawyer failing to take notice of the concern, Thibodeau ran to a FedEx Kinko's the next day and sent an email to Runstorf's second lawyer in the hopes of getting an acknowledgement that the message had been received. No response. As the guilt and frustration began to take hold of him, that Thursday, he decided it was time to wipe his hands of the whole ordeal, and he drafted his resignation letter. Before sending it, however, his mind started racing about all the possible outcomes. Inevitably, 
His departure would mean that Healy and Riedel would be all over him to get the dirt that he obviously knew. And the last thing a publicist wants is to become the story himself. Holding off from resigning, the stress from not hearing back from either of the lawyers sent Thibodeau's mind racing. And that Friday, September 28th, he decided that the only way he could clear his conscience was by reaching out to Runstorf directly. This time, Bethany Walsh would take a back seat to a new account named Sarah Finkelstein. The walls are about to cave in on Mr. Sprecher. Sprecher and the Rebecca Broadway production. Unbeknownst to Thibodeau, Runstorf had sensed something was awry due to a series of concerning emails his attorneys had received earlier in the week. But it was only once Runstorf received the email directly that he decided to withdraw his investment. The next day, it was becoming clear the show had no way of moving forward. And following Sprecher's meeting with the federal prosecutor, Thibodeau submitted his resignation email. But before leaving, he made good on one last request by Sprecher the next day, releasing a one-page press release denouncing the extremely malicious emails that had made Runsdorf withdraw from the show. Emails which had been written by Bethany Walsh and Sarah Finkelstein. And just like that, the dream musical that was intended to be a crowning moment for Sprecher and for Lenza, a redemption moment for the breadest Michael Kunza, and a launching pad moment for actors like Ryan Silverman, Jill Pace, Karen Mason, and Nick Wyman, came crashing down around them in a giant plume of smoke. The dream of Manderley was no more. Following the collapse of Rebecca, the pressure on Sprecher was amplified. Not only was he liable for repaying the $6 million for investors that they had already spent, he also found himself front and center in investigations from the FBI, the SEC, and the U.S. Attorney's Office. A series of investigations found that while Sprecher's motives were suspicious, it had less to do with a direct involvement in a con and more so due to being a panicked producer who bit off more than he bargained for. The investigators realized that instead of being a perpetrator of the scheme, Sprecher was just one in an ever-growing list of victims that had been duped by con man Mark Houghton. It turns out the show wasn't the first to meet Paul Abrams and his three investing partners, as the three had been the same cast Houghton had used in an elaborate real estate scam. The email correspondence, Abrams to assistants, the executor of estate, Mr. Wexler, and the four investors were all inventions of the East Coast fraudster, Mark Houghton. The woman that Sprecher had met alleging to be Abrams' niece turned out instead to be Houghton's own wife. And the $1.1 million bridge loan that Sprecher was dependent on never truly existed. The loan company was part of a second set of fictional lenders and companies, designed to lure Sprecher and Forlenza into paying Houghton and his entities $35,000. This was added on top of the nearly $60,000 they had paid him for his trips to London and other dealings with the production. In 2016, Mark Houghton would be sentenced to more than 11 years in prison for nearly two decades of fraudulent activities ranging from 1995 to 2012. He wound up only serving three, and as of 2020, he's traded out his sleek suit for a blue polo, becoming a car salesman at a Long Island Volkswagen dealership. All the while, the show's former publicist, Mark Thibodeau's life, had become one dominated by paranoia and a constant need to look over his shoulder after the impact of his actions came to light. That same month, Thibodeau was ultimately served with a lawsuit 
from Sprecher and Forlenza for defamation and breach of contract. Even though Thibodeau had taken great care to send the emails from discrete locations, what he wasn't counting on was that Google not only traced where the emails were sent from, but also where the accounts were created. This meant that all roads led back to Thibodeau's apartment. The case would sit in limbo for years. All the while, Sprecher and Forlenza desperately kept announcing new show dates and inevitable delays when the duo officially lost access to the rights. And just like that, the last piece of hope for the duo bringing Rebecca to the Great White Way had vanished. While the tale of producer Ben Sprecher would continue to intensify and take a disturbing and triggering turn in the years that would follow, that's a complicated story for someone else to tell. The story of Rebecca the Musical would officially come to an end on May 10th, 2017, when Mark Thibodeau would be sentenced to pay a total of $90,000. Still not nearly enough to even make a dent in what Sprecher and Forlenza owed to their investors. So what is the legacy of Rebecca? Despite never making it to Broadway, the show continues to be a smash hit with productions around the world, and it remains a personal favorite of creator Michael Kunza. Whether or not it would have set Broadway on fire during the early 2010s remains to be seen. But there's no denying that its scandal-laden history made it a perfect fit in a Broadway season that was ripe with drama. What makes the story just as compelling nearly 10 years later is thanks in large part to how it shines the light on how the financials of a show can make or break a production. While many shows on Broadway can attribute their undoing to a lackluster score or a flimsy story, few fail to highlight the ruthlessness and unforgiving nature of Broadway politics and economics. The show had a proven track record around the globe, but its failure to launch in America was due in large part to greed, poor planning, and an overall lack of trust amongst the team. While Hadestown had been a celebration of overcoming the odds through a beautiful 13-year collaboration, Rebecca was an 11-year nightmare that serves as a stark reminder that the almighty dollar can sink even the surest of bets. It was the naive yet inspiring optimism of the entire production that kept attorney Ronald G. Russo involved for as long as he was. He had been so taken with the promise that the show represented that his client became more than just Ben Sprecher. His client was Rebecca. In addition to being one of the biggest scandals in Broadway history, it's important to remember that underneath the headlines is still a group of human beings, many of whom were robbed of a potentially life-changing moment due to the actions of a few. Rebecca is suspense. Rebecca is revelation. Rebecca is heartbreak. And even though the production collapsed with the fiery embers of Manderley, the legacy behind the scenes will continue to live on. In a story filled with twists and turns that would have made Daphne du Maurier and Alfred Hitchcock themselves shake their heads in disbelief. Rebecca was hardly the first musical to fall victim to harsh ridicule from Broadway elites. Perhaps one of the best showcases of Broadway's towering barrier to entry happened in the mega-musical-dominated 1980s, and it almost robbed the world of a composer that would change the industry forever.